All right, the uh, American Revolution. This picture right here, this is uh, Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, one of the battles that they did back then, back in the day, this was on uh, Christmas Eve, he was crossing over uh, to go into New Jersey and uh, fight a bunch of German mercenaries. It wasn't just him in this boat, uh, it, was, it was his entire army. You can see back here, where he was taking the horses, horses all freaked out about being in the boat. Uh, yeah, but he took his entire army across there. So a little bit of what we're gonna talk about today, how the war started, uh, formation of the Continental Army, talk about a couple of the battles and uh, how the Continental Army kind of evolved. So at the outbreak, this is on Lexington Green. 1774, the first Continental Congress, they petitioned the king. They, we, we talked before about the, uh, the Intolerable Acts, the uh, Boston Tea Party, the Boston Massacre, you know, all, all, the, all the tensions that were going on between uh, the, the North American English colonies and uh, Britain itself. Um, the colonists, they considered themselves Englishmen first. And that's what they do. They just wanted to be Englishmen. They wanted representation in Parliament. Uh, they thought they were getting a raw deal from the king. At the time, the king, he was trying to gain more control away from Parliament and be a proper king. Uh, he was also looking for a way to pay off the war debt from the French and Indian War. If you remember, the French and Indian War uh, was fought against the French um, to protect English interests in the new world, uh, as well as all over, the, all, all over the rest of the world. Anyway, so they petitioned the king, as with the First Continental Congress. They adopted non-importation exportation agreements, meaning they were gonna stop uh, importing goods from England and stop exporting raw materials from, from the colonies. Uh, and they formed committees to enforce these agreements. They basically owned uh, the city councils all over the, all over the, the the colonies. They formed these militias. Militias are just part-time workers. Um, they drill on the weekend. Um, some of them drill once a year, depending on on where the uh, the militia itself was. There it was an all volunteer force, kind of like a, a volunteer fire department. Um, at the time, they still had raids from natives, raids from rogue Fr Frenchmen, rogue Frenchmen. Um, so the towns closer to the interior, so this is uh, this Boston Harbor here. And then to the right of that, as you're looking at it, is the Atlantic Ocean. So the more towards the interior you get, the rougher it, the rougher it becomes. So these guys, the militia here in Boston, they might, they might train once a month, whereas these guys are training like every other day, a couple times a week. Uh, and they began storing munitions. These were munition dumps in Lexington and Concord. Uh, the British, fearing a rup an uprising in 1775, April 1775, they marched to get those munitions. This is cannon, powder, cannonballs, that kind of thing. Uh, Paul Revere, he made his famous ride. He rode across the bay here, jumped on a horse, borrowed a horse, came across, made his fam famous ride going town to town. Uh, letting everybody know that the, the, the regulars, as he called them, the British Army was coming. And, and then he got captured here. Another guy, Dawes, he went south where Revere went north, Dawes went south. Dawes did not get captured. He didn't, he didn't get rolled up. He actually finished going along the ride with another guy. Um, name kind of escapes me right now. But Dawes finished off and uh, got all the way up there in order to warn Sam Adams and uh, the other Minutemen. Minutemen were a special kind of uh, quick reaction uh, militia. They were required, they had to have their gun and powder at a ready, like right by the door, always had their boots on, that kind of thing. They were, at a minute's notice, they were able to assemble. All right, formation of the Continental Army. After, after Lexington and Concord, known as the shot that was heard around the world, right? Um, Con 
the first Continental Congress, they realized they needed a Continental Army. They needed uh, a regular army. So they enlisted guys for a year, a little over a year, uh, put George Washington in command, hero of the French and Indian War. And uh, the army was made up of militia and a volunteer army. So they, they weren't conscripting, they weren't drafting people yet. The invasion of Panama, or uh, invasion of Panama, invasion of Canada and the fall of Boston. Um, we're not gonna go over the battle too much, but basically we've got uh, Benedict Arnold. He came up this way and he attacked Quebec and Montgomery. General Montgomery came up this way, attacked Montreal. Uh, this was a pretty big battle here. And then he moved on up, up to Quebec to help uh, Benedict Arnold take it. Washington moved on Boston and uh, he laid siege to Boston and eventually forced the British to evacuate. Uh, so a couple pretty big wins right from the outset. Uh, good setbacks for the, for the British. And then in 1776, right? So, so this is 1775. Then the next year, 1776, they realized uh, that the king is not gonna be able to um, treat them as citizens and they're gonna declare their independence as the United States of America. So July 4th, 1776, that's, it. that's the Declaration of Independence signed. It's called Independence Day, July 4th, America's birthday. Um, and then they create this Articles of Confederation. And we'll talk about that a little later in other lessons. But it created a loose confederation. And the government we have now is a federation. We got a little stronger central government, not a centralized government as, as say France does, but we got a strong central government as compared to a confederation, which is just a bunch of states working together. Issues, they could not levy taxes. You'll hear more about this. Um, they could just ask states for some money and they could not create an army. Um, they had to get the states, the individual states to volunteer uh, men from their militia in order to create the Continental Army. So it never reached its full strength, this Continental Army, never reached the full strength. They had to rely on militia to fill the ranks. Now the militia, they, they weren't allowed to leave their state. So wherever a campaign was taking place, the Continental Army would have to move in and uh, they would get the militia to come in and help from that particular state. Uh, incidentally, that's where we get the, the rank of private because a private citizen, the private soldier would come in and he'd be the lowest ranking. Uh, he would be under the regular army. It was controlled by Congress and run by a committee. And if you've ever seen anything run by a committee, it's a pretty big disaster. Um, everybody's got their own voice. Everybody wants to do one thing or another. Uh, becomes a giant compromise. Um, and this is how we ended up with the president being the commander in chief of the armed forces in, in our constitution. Uh, it was to avoid the issues here. You had splinter groups where one committee or one section of the committee would splinter off and start commanding a complete different section of the army, um, trying to usurp Washington's uh, leadership and that kind of thing. Uh, changed a little later on, but that's what was going on in the beginning. And then they started a draft, but the draft allowed soldiers to serve part time. Um, and that's something with the militia that as the militia is, is turned into and evolved into the uh, National Guard and the reserves um, that still exists. Uh, you can go home, you can refuse your orders if you're in the Guard or, or reserves, you can refuse orders. Might not be very good for your career, but you don't have to take orders. That's about the middle of it. All right, next, British problem. Uh, the problems that the British had. The army could not meet expectations. The army was uh, engaged elsewhere. Um, the American Revolution was kind of a sideshow for the Brits. So they hired 30,000 Hessian mercenaries. These, these are green coats. Uh, these are the German mercenaries, soldiers for hire. Um, 
they were constantly losing people from battle disease, desertion. Uh, these were guys coming all the way over from England. They didn't want to fight in the Americas. They had no interest at all in the Americas, but here they were. And they were also fighting fellow Englishmen. They, they didn't appreciate that. Logistics, they'd traveled 3000 miles worth of ocean. It took several months just to get them here. Uh, also, they're trying to communicate their movements back. It takes several months, it'd take a half a year for that communication to go back and forth. Had to get all their provisions from England. Um, first, there wasn't very much manufacturing in the Americas uh, because of the British laws regarding manufacturing. Uh, second, the, the Patriots, talk about Patriots and Loyalists, the Patriots wouldn't give the British anything um, and they would, they would harass the people who did. Uh, like I said, the Loyalists, they weren't reliable. Very few turned out and the Patriots controlled the local councils. Uh, the Patriots were pretty big bullies at this time. They would they controlled the city councils and they would harass and, and physically sometimes, not just verbally, but physically sometimes harass anybody that opposed them. Uh, they had an idea that they were gonna get the job done and they decided to do it. The British, their strategy, they planned year to year. They didn't really have a clear objective. Uh, they didn't want to entirely crush the colonists, um, they, but they couldn't let them do whatever they wanted. So their objective was kind of um, hold, hold, hold it, hold the line, and it didn't work out very well. The colonists, they had a defensive strategy. They just could just sit down and wait, wait for the British to come to them. They didn't really have an offensive plan. Uh, for the first few years of the war, they weren't trying to break free. Remember that they weren't trying to break free. They just wanted their rights asserted as proper Englishmen. Um, but they weren't really trying to kick anybody out either. They're just playing the def defensive game. This, this had mostly to do with lack of manufacturing, um, not really the lack of support, but uh, inexperienced fighting, that kind of thing. Um, they're just first few years they were working on building up to the point where they could have an offensive strategy so what did washington do he would just stand in the way of the british advancing wherever the british went he'd just go block their road harass them for a while did not seek battle for limited objective uh he retreated a lot for the first few years if there was nothing big coming out of a win he wouldn't fight it if everything was just going to stay the same after he won he didn't fight that battle. Now, if he did get something big, if he did get something big, such as battles of Trenton and Princeton, then he would make that play. Um, but otherwise, not so much. Battle of Bunker Hill, this one's interesting. Um, it's kind of in our American lore, part of the American myth. Battle of Bunker Hill, Hill Battle of Bunker Hill. Yeah, it's listed as a British victory because it was. Uh, the British ended up taking the hill um, and, and winning the, the, the ground, so to speak. Uh, but at the same time, they lost so many men in that battle uh, that they might they, they might as well have just left and, and not, not tried because they didn't get anything out of it. It was a minor victory um, at a great cost. All right, Trenton and Princeton. This is that picture um, where Washington's crossing the Delaware. This is kind of a different version of it. You see his horses up there and horses in the background all crowded in these boats. They still got the ice flows, right? Because this happened on New Year's Eve. Uh, Washington had 2,400 men under him across the Delaware. Oh, he split it into two forces here and here. Uh, Ewing was supposed to cross down below Trenton and move up, but he never did. Washington crossed over here and then split his forces again so he could come around here and flank. Remember, what did we say? We had 30,000 Hessians or something like that. Um, but Washington split his for forces here so that he could flank at, uh, at Trenton. Um, attacked on Christmas morning. Hessians, basically the Germans, they woke up and uh, they were already under fire. Um, 
and then he did it. He played that game again on December 31st. He uh, crossed it again and attacked Princeton. Where else are Princeton? Up here to Princeton. Uh, reason he did that is because remember the regular forces, they could only be drafted and they only had contractual obligations for a year. That time was coming up. So Washington made some big plays before his army went home for the winter. And that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments.